thank you for all, uh, all for coming back from the break. I know it's very tempting to stay at the, uh, the coffee stations and things like this. Rest assured, there is one more session before lunch, and, uh, and that is us. So as Mark mentioned, my name is Scott Galvez. I'm one of the co-founders of Intercultural Elements based in Leipzig, Germany. And up here with me is Jesse Rag. Hi, he everyone. heads up the sales department at Intercultural Elements, and uh, very happy to have his expertise up here. He also works with sellers like yourself on a daily basis. So yeah, great to have you. Thank you. Right. So. On the lunch theme, we're actually going to talk about something sort of food related. Eggs, eggs in baskets. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. We all know this from you know, being a child all the way up to, to adult life. Um, but it's something that we don't always necessarily adhere to. And we're going to focus that theme on which marketplaces you expand to and why it's so important to diversify onto many different marketplaces. Absolutely. And one of the reasons that we're up here today, why we've been asked to talk to you, is because this is exactly where we specialize. We help hundreds of e-commerce retailers, just like yourselves, expand into all of the marketplaces in different countries around the world. We've got a team of about 50 staff members from more than 15 nationalities who all work together to help our clients figure out which of their products they should be selling in which countries and which marketplaces within those countries to help them get the best ROI. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to take some of that expertise from the last decade and try and condense it into the next 30 minutes to give you a list of marketplaces that you may want to add to your business plan, be it for next week or for in six months' time or a couple of years' time. Ideally, we're going to list some marketplaces that you may have never heard of before um, so that you know they exist and you know whether or not they're going to be the right ones for you in the future. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So when people think about international expansion, they usually think about some huge daunting task. And to be fair, there is a fair amount to it, right? I'm not exactly sure how many people have already sort of expanded internationally here, just by a show of hands. OK, that's a fair number. So there is a lot to it. But if you break it down, we like to think of it in three main keys to a successful international expansion. And those keys are, quite simply, Number one, building a strategy. Now, this is an essential key that a lot of people skip all together. Right? It's vital just to figure out, first of all, which countries and which marketplaces you want to go to. Secondly, once you have that plan in place, you want to implement correctly. And that's what we say uh, when we say expand intelligently. That means specifically localizing to make sure that you're catering to a local audience. Translating and translating properly, not with a machine translation, but rather with proper people who know the language. And then lastly, making sure that you have all that translated data and you're trusting that to somebody who really knows the marketplace in that country. Very often, that's a native. And then once you've had all of that, uh, once you've dedicated all that time and resource to that, of course, you want to make sure that you stay listed. And that's why we say sustain your success. Right? That usually means having a customer service team who are native speaking, who can make sure that your feedback stay really high so that make sure that you, you keep on listing on that marketplace. So that was just a bit of a nutshell. We today at Lin Academy, we want to go deep into the implementation part. And one part which I think a lot of people are actually sort of lacking on, and that is diversification. Why diversification? Well, if you talk to pretty much any investor, they will tell you that one of the keys to a long-term successful strategy for investing is diversification. Don't put all of your eggs in one basket. right? But why is it that this common sense is not common practice with something that which is so vital to us as our e-commerce businesses? If you would, imagine your business as a table. The table has legs, right? Each leg under that table is a marketplace. Maybe that's Amazon.co.uk for yourself. Maybe it's Amazon.com. And by the way, we have nothing against Amazon here, but I think a lot of uh, sellers out there, they sell primarily on Amazon nowadays. Okay. Now, think about those table legs. If you have multiple marketplaces, maybe you sell on Amazon France, you have a couple more table legs out there. How thick is that table leg? How much revenue do you have going through there? And what happens, God forbid, if one of those table legs or multiple table legs are swept out from underneath that table because of a suspension or something else? Is your table stable enough to, to stay standing? This is one of the reasons for diversification. Okay? And there's reason, a lot of reasons why that type of thing can happen. Absolutely. And if, you know, on the topic of why, 
the table legs are really important to, as Scott said, keep your, keep your table standing, keep your business alive. And as great as Amazon is, we already know that. We, we're already reliant on Amazon for a lot of our business. So looking at reasons to expand beyond Amazon, um, there's a number of things which are completely outside of our control. For example, legislation. What happens if a new law comes into effect tomorrow that stops you being able to run your business as it is? Back in 2009, one of our very first customers, um, he was selling knives online in the UK until a new law came into effect almost overnight that stopped him being able to sell knives online in the UK. His whole business could have gone under, his table could have fallen over, but fortunately he had other legs. He was selling on eBay in, uh, and Amazon in other countries so that he was able to have time. He still had sales coming in, his business survived, and he was able to diversify his product range. He started selling his knives internationally, and he, brought his, uh, he diversified his product range in the UK, but he had the time to do that. The elephant in the room for us today in 2018 is Brexit. Obviously, the jury's still out. No one really knows what's going to happen. But if you're a UK seller and you're looking at what's going to happen in, in Brexit, are you prepared for that? Are you diversified enough that if you can't suddenly sell to European countries, are you selling in marketplaces in North America or Australia or Japan? These are all reasons that you need to be looking at diversification as soon as possible. And, and on that topic is also VAT, or sales tax in the USA. If you're registered for Amazon's Pan-EU FBA program, as good as it is, you'll know that you, you're now liable for, tax, uh, for filing taxes in seven European countries. UK, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Czech Republic, and Poland. But you don't even get sales from those last two. So why not also sell on Allegro, the largest marketplace in Poland? Actually get some sales coming in from Polish buyers to help offset the costs that you're already paying to the Polish government. Sales tax in the USA is the same issue. Amazon wants to move your items around a number of states in the US. Are you, are you paying the right taxes in each of those countries? And if you are, are you looking at the other marketplaces within those countries to get the best bang for buck? Account suspensions. Obviously, any marketplace <coughs> could suspend you, but Amazon is uh, well known for this. How many of you have already been unfairly suspended on Amazon? <laughs> OK. That's, that's not fair. It's basically Amazon saying, hey, you know what? You're not allowed to run your business in this country. If you're only selling on Amazon Germany, in Germany, and Amazon says you can't sell there anymore, whether you've done something wrong or their bots think you've done something wrong, all that money that you've invested in translations, the product that you've got sitting in Germany, the customer service guy that you've hired to, do, to deal with your German buyers, it's all for nothing. But if you're selling on other German marketplaces as well, at least it wasn't all for, for nothing. At least you've got other use for that. And on that topic is also translations. If you've gone down the road of paying for good quality translations and you're wondering how to justify that cost, because you know human translations aren't always cheap, they're better quality, but if you're going to actually do that and you're going to pay money for good quality German or French translations, get them onto as many marketplaces as possible. How do you justify that cost to the, to the uh, finance team? Well, you say, yeah, they're not just for Amazon, they're for eBay and Cdiscount and Otto and Real and Zalando and so on and so forth and our own website as well. And this is going to help you get the most bang for your buck out of the translations. So we've talked quite a bit about the whys. Yeah, what can go wrong to cause those table legs to be swept out from, from under your business, right? So, and there's a lot of reasons. Okay? Now we're going to shift gears from the why to the how. How do you expand internationally? And for purposes of our conversation today, that means alternative marketplaces. Okay, you're already selling on maybe Amazon, maybe some other marketplace, but how do you expand? So it's sort of interesting because there's so many marketplaces out there. We're going to talk a little bit about this in, uh, in a bit, but how do we figure out which countries are right for you? Because the right country for you is probably going to be a very different country than for you. Right? And the marketplaces, maybe even in those countries, are going to be different for you than for you. So what we attempted to do today is out of the 30 plus marketplaces that we have a lot of experience listing into, we chose 10 different sales channels, nine of them being marketplaces, to tell you about. And as Jesse mentioned before, it could very well be that you say, man, that is exactly what I need to, to launch on next week. Or based on this information that you're going to get today, hopefully you can write down a few things and say, OK, this is something that I could imagine doing maybe in six months or a year. Whatever the case, it's all about education and figuring out exactly which is correct for you. So jumping straight into it, C-Discount is one that I'm sure a lot of you are selling on or have at least heard of. They tend to be uh, very proactive at contacting sellers. And 
what a lot of people don't necessarily know is that it is the second biggest marketplace in all of France. Okay? And um, actually, a Tame Bay article that came out a couple of weeks ago also revealed that they are currently expanding to Belgium, Germany, Italy, and Spain. So they're on the march, so to say. It's very, very strong across a number of different categories, pretty much um, all types of home, um, garden, uh, things like uh, dress, uh, sort of apparel, shoes. Uh, and through our relationship with C-Discount, they are specifically looking for home and garden range. So if you have any sort of home and garden products, you may want to jot down C-Discount. Now, you've noticed we have some heads up, right, coming up in just a second here. Um, to follow up the thumbs up, right? Thumbs up are always the positive things, but of course, for every single marketplace, there is some heads up as well. Now, one which is uh, sort of in between that, C Discount also has um, something called C Logistic, okay, which is their answer to Amazon's FBA. Okay, so if you don't necessarily want to send, uh, if you don't have any sort of uh, you know logistic ability in France, then C Logistic could be that answer. A couple of other things to look out for with C-Discount, machine translation, bit of a double-edged sword, isn't it? Right? A lot of people think, oh, this is great, right? They pay for my translations, but in a country like France, where people really value the quality of the language, yeah, machine translations may not necessarily cut it. So you may want to actually go with proper translations here. And then you should be able to provide French customer service when you're selling in France, sort of logical. And that goes for pretty much all of the marketplaces that we're going to talk about today. But keep in mind, that doesn't necessarily need to be a showstopper for you, right? There's a lot of companies out there that can provide customer service for you, even down to the minute, so you're not wasting money um, on, on extra services there. So, Rayal, you may or may not have heard of. It's one that I'm pretty excited about. So we both live in Germany, and Rayal is one that is really upping its game in the last couple of years. It's kind of Germany's answer to Tesco or Walmart. It's a household name. There's brick and mortar stores all over the country. Um, and about a couple of years ago, they obviously went down this line of thinking that Tesco and Walmart did where they've basically gone, you know what? We've got a great, well-established online marketplace. We've already got an online website. We've got all of our products as well. But if we don't open up to third-party sellers, we're going to get left behind by Amazon. So they did that. And they didn't just try and reinvent the wheel or anything like that. They actually were kind of clever. They, they bought um, an already well-established marketplace in Germany called Hitmeister. They've rebranded it. They've used that already well-established infrastructure um, to be able to onboard third-party sellers pretty quickly. We've got a number of sellers already on there. Obviously, yes, you need to list it in Germany. You need to do German customer service. Um, but if you can do that, Rail is one of these websites that does have the ability to contend with the likes of Amazon and eBay. Um, it really is a well-known, respected brand in Germany. So if you know, I don't need to sell Germany to you. It's one of the biggest e-commerce market, uh, e markets in the world. So Rayal is definitely one that should be on your roadmap. One heads up for you, again, on the topic of Brexit. Right now, they have the requirement of a European Union business entity. I don't know what that's going to look like come March. I can imagine that right now, or I know for a fact that right now, it's pretty easy to get up and running on there. I find it hard to believe they're going to kick off established sellers in the event of a hard Brexit. So my tip would be to get on pre-Brexit. Um, it is pretty easy to get set up and running. All right, moving from a well-established e-commerce country to one that you may not necessarily expect in Sweden. Now, Findig, translated from Swedish, uh, this means bargain. Okay? And um, one of the nice things about Findig is that it offers sort of a, a quite a low barrier to getting on board. Right? Why is that? Well, a lot of people think that you immediately have to translate into a native language to be able to sell on marketplaces. And in most cases, that is the case, but not with Findig. For about a year and a half now, they've allowed people to sell in English. Okay? So this offers a bit of a soft launch into the Nordic area, an area which people have a lot of money, and there aren't necessarily a lot of real active marketplaces there. So this can be, uh, this can be a great place to go there. Uh, new sellers of gadgets, toys, and fashion. Those are categories that they're really looking um, to, to beef up. And a couple things to, to just watch out for uh, with Findig is that it is a flash sale. So what does that mean for you as a seller? Well, specifically, the way that a flash sale works is that, let's say I buy something from one of you who's selling on Findig. Findig immediately buys that product from you in a flash, so to say, right? And then Findig is the um, is a seller of record. Now, a little bit of a negative, negative tinge to that is that they then control the sale, so you have a lot less access to the information. 
Okay, um, a, but, uh, a bit of a, a positive there is the fact that they also handle all of the customer service in Swedish. So you don't necessarily have to, um, have to deal with that. Um, and then last but not least, do be aware that you can't necessarily use uh, FBA, if you use FBA, to fulfill orders. Findig doesn't want that competition. So coming from Sweden, back to a little bit closer to home, market. Now, if you don't necessarily recognize market, uh, I wouldn't blame you. Market is a brand new marketplace that is out there. And just to take a step back real fast, why would we talk about a brand new marketplace? Let's face it, marketplaces are really sort of a dime a dozen nowadays, aren't there? And there's, through you know, all these marketplaces that are coming out, there's so much competition. Um, a lot of you have probably read on Tame Bay or other sources that there are numerous marketplaces, Rakuten UK, for example, Tesco, right? Even DHL's own marketplace, all you need in Germany, they're all going bust, they're closing. That is testimony to how competitive this really is. Okay? So why are we talking about a brand new marketplace? Well, because they have a decent amount of marketing um, and sort of oomph behind them, and they're in the process. It's actually, uh, they've been building it for about two years now, and they're just in the process of, of finalizing it, getting all the categories uh, sort of built in. And when it does open up, it's one of those that are really going to give uh, other marketplaces a run for their money. Competitive fee-wise, right, it's actually quite competitive compared to the likes of Amazon, et cetera. Um, and they also allow FBA fulfillment, so you don't necessarily have to worry about that. So a couple of heads ups. It is a brand new marketplace, right? So you're not necessarily going to get the exact same traction that you would from an Amazon. But nonetheless, it can be very good to be, uh, to be there first. And then last but not least, as I mentioned, some categories are still sort of forthcoming. What I would recommend is Market actually has a stand right next to ours um, out in the lobby here. So do uh, take uh, a walk over there and chat with them if you're interested in selling on Market. So Trade Me is one that a lot of you have probably heard, heard of before. Um, you may or may not have actually started selling there yet. It's actually New Zealand's largest marketplace. It's, if you ask a lot of Kiwis, it's the only marketplace. It's massive. It's basically the one place to go to to buy everything online in, trade, in, uh, in New Zealand. And although New Zealand only has a population of about 5 million people, we've seen some of our sellers do better there than they do on Amazon Japan with 180 million. So this is one that should definitely be on the rate roadmap. Obviously, you can list in English. That goes without saying. Um, and it is strong across, across all categories. One thing, one great opportunity for you with TradeMe that makes it really worthwhile is the really competitive commission rates. Um, I think they do something about 9.85% across, um, across all categories, which when you compare that to Amazon is pretty decent. Now, whether it's a case of using that low commission rate to help offset the costs of obviously fulfilling to New Zealand, um, or if it's just so that you can start offering better prices than your local competition there, um, either way that does help to get rid of a lot of the barriers to entry. It is a marketplace, though, that, does, that doesn't just take anyone on as a seller. If you're here today and you, you've not yet started or you're not selling on a number of marketplaces yet or you're still sort of growing, um, this is one for maybe for the future because they do want to have some evidence of sales before they'll um, accept new sellers. There, there are some marketplaces which are almost impossible to get onto without a lot of evidence. These guys just want to know that your products are going to sell, that it is worth them investing the time at their end to help you get started. Um, but as long as you can build up a good business case as to why they should let you on as a third-party seller, um, it is quite straightforward to start selling there. Cool Shop. Are there a lot of people that recognize the name Cool Shop? Yeah, a couple, right? Funny enough, this marketplace has been around since 2003. And they started in Denmark, but then they've expanded out into seven different countries. And there's a couple of uh, pretty cool points about Cool Shop. Um, there's really no sort of sign-up fees, and they do have extremely low commission rates. Another thing which is really nice, too, is they're, again, trying to take out a lot of the barriers that a lot of people, that stop a lot of people from selling. That means, number one, all you have to do is put it in, uh, uh, is upload it in English, and then they will translate it to all of these different languages. Again, double-edged sword, this since it's machine translation, but you can sell to all those countries pretty quickly. The second thing is, you can just put in a pound price, and then they will automatically adjust currency-wise uh, to all of those different currencies, since there's a bunch of them in that list. Now, do be aware, one heads up here, is that, uh, is that this doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get the, the best exchange rate um, when they automatically exchange it. But nonetheless, again, you're giving up a little bit of that, um, of that cost for the flexibility. 
So Frugo um, is one that has really been growing very quickly in the last couple of years. It was one that sort of plodded along for a few years and sort of failed to gain any, um, any major traction. But within the, in the last two years, um, I'm hearing from loads of our clients that it's just skyrocketing, which is really, really nice to see. It's available in 32 countries. It's sort of known as the cross-border marketplace. Um, similar to Cool Shop, it's a case of just listing in English and they do most of the work for you. Yes, it's machine translation again. This is one of those cases where, you know what, it doesn't matter. Let's just get those products listed in English and have your products available in the other countries as well as you can. They take care of all of the marketing for you. Um, they make it really simple to get into a number of countries that you've probably never even thought about selling to. Um, you know, it's available in Kuwait, Bahrain, Russia, Finland, the countries where you think, you know what, maybe in 10 years' time, once I've got rid of, once I'm selling on the, the ones that are priorities for me. But with a pretty quick and easy process through listing on Frugo, your products are at least available in those countries. And hey, you know what, if you suddenly notice that it's flying off the shelves in Russia, maybe you can start looking at some expansion options into Russia and doing that with a little bit more gusto and actually um, taking advantage of that. So Frugo is one that's really worth looking at. And, uh, and yeah, absolutely, Allegro. Um, I mentioned Allegro previously. It's the number one marketplace in Poland. Actually, behind Facebook and YouTube, it's actually the most visited website in Poland. It's the go-to place to buy anything online. It's, with that, it's strong in all categories. Um, again, if you're using Pan-EU FBA and you're registered for and paying VAT in Poland, why not get some sales there too? There's a decent population of people there. It's a growing economy. It's well worth being on. If you're able to fulfill to Germany or um, if you're able to fulfill to Central Europe, it's not that much further to start getting your items into Poland. And Allegro definitely offers a great opportunity for that. Obviously, you do need to be able to list your items in Polish and offer Polish customer service. Um, whether you do this in-house or if you outsource this, there's plenty of options for either. Um, but realistically, Allegro is very strong in all categories. I think their weakest category is fashion, but that's not to say that you can't sell fashion on there. Um, it's just not as much of a, uh, a go-to thing for fashion. And then staying in, uh, in Eastern Europe, specifically now Southeastern Europe, right? Uh, you know, I mentioned in the beginning, we chose these marketplaces because they hold certain advantages. Even though you may not have heard of them, they may be good places to expand to, yeah, either now or, or later on. So EMAG. Not a lot of people have heard of this, but it's actually one of the largest marketplaces in Romania, uh, Bulgaria, Hungary, and then to a lesser extent in Poland. Okay? Uh, but they do offer a lot of advantages. They're really trying to take all those barriers away. So what are the major barriers that would stop you from listing in those countries? Well, translation. So they're translating your first top 100 sellers for free into those languages. They're also doing things like, um, they, they want you to basically send your stock to a centralized warehouse that they have in those countries, right? And they realize that you may not be willing to do that in comparison to, let's say, an Amazon FBA situation. Well, what they're doing is they can subsidize the cost of shipping your products there. And then, if it doesn't work out for you, they'll actually subsidize the cost of that product getting shipped back. So they're really trying to take away the risk there. Um, they're also offering... Um, other incentives. Uh, so if you're interested, you know, either contact us, let us know, and we can tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, but we're trying to go through this relatively quickly. So, um, so right, home and garden, automobile, toys, and DIY, those are the categories they're specifically looking to build out right now. So I mentioned that, uh, that desire that they have for you to uh, have your products in those countries. One of the main reasons for that is because in those countries, they have uh, cash on delivery as a standard method of payment, right? Something we're not necessarily used to here in the UK, right? Well, um, that's not a problem when they use uh, their logistics system from their warehouse, right? So having your stock there enables them to collect payments. So that's no longer a problem either. EU presence is preferred. So if you're just UK based, that is something you may want to consider yeah, with the whole Brexit situation going on. So catch.com.au, we're going back to the other side of the world. Um, you may or may not have heard of it. It used to be called Catch of the Day. Um, I actually, I lived in Australia for about five years, and this, for me, was where I used to buy everything. You had eBay. Until last year, you only had eBay or a variety of other web shops to buy things on in Australia. Catch.com.au, catch, .com, catch of the Day, it was sort of the go-to place to buy an Under Armour T-shirt for 50% off or a pair of Ugg boots for $30. And 
because of that, because it was really known as the place to get a really good deal um, in an expensive country like Australia, it has a massive following there. It's really, really well known. And again, they decided about two years ago to rebrand to catch.com.au and to open up uh, to third party sellers. Now, because of the fact that they're already selling a number of products themselves, there are some brand restrictions. Um, you know, I mentioned, for example, Under Armour, UGG, they sell some of these brands themselves. That is their core business. Um, but as long as you're not competing on their brands that they're selling, if you can add more products to let them increase the range of products to Australian buyers, it's a fantastic marketplace to be on. Um, obviously, fulfill fulfillment to Australia is the big, um, the big hurdle here. But if you're already looking at, for example, Amazon Australia, then chances are this is something that helps you cover the costs of maybe having products stored, uh, stored in Australia. It's not just for Amazon anymore. It might also be for Catch and eBay. Um, and there are slowly but surely more marketplaces coming into Australia as well. So it is an area of the world to be looking at. Good. And last but not least, we have your own website. This is something that, of course, we, we have to mention, right? As a sales channel, a lot of people are so focused on marketplaces, they don't necessarily think about a website in the countries that you sell into. And for good reason, there are some pros and cons to this. Specifically, what are some of the pros, right? Well, you do have full control over your marketing, right? And the buyer's information belongs to you, which is really nice, instead of going through a marketplace where you don't get full access to that information. There's little or no commission on, a, uh, on a, your own website like once you build that. But of course, we very often suggest to people, once you, uh, let's say, to expand into a country, you first want to go to the marketplaces because, of course, they're doing all the marketing for you, so you don't have to worry about that. The last thing you want to do is say, yeah, you know what? I think I really want to expand to, uh, expand to, to Spain, and I'm going to pay all this money to get my site translated and, uh, and, and set up. And then, if you haven't been selling on marketplaces, there's no Spanish to actually go to your website. right? So marketplaces first. And then if you're established there, then you definitely want to follow up, in most cases, with a website.